Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Royal Army Museum in Brussels, part of the War Heritage Institute in Belgium, taking a look at some of the fantastically rare and cool firearms that they have in their reserve collection. Today we have a Patchett machine carbine. This is the predecessor to the Sterling submachine gun that was eventually adopted by the British military, and original Patchets are extremely rare. So a very cool opportunity to take a look at one. Now this was developed, uh, designed, by a guy named George William Patchett, who interestingly, if you want to talk about other things that uh, people did, he was at one time the world land speed record holder on a motorcycle. At any rate, he was primarily an arms designer. He had worked in, in at FN before World War II. He worked in Czechoslovakia before World War II at the Brno factory. And in 1939 he came back to the UK and went to work in the British small arms industry. He was working at Stirling, where they were manufacturing Lanchester submachine guns, and started developing his own design, something that would be better than the Lanchester. Lighter, handier, cheaper. The Lanchester was, well, heavy bulky and expensive. Uh, first development work began in 1942, and by late 1943 he had his first prototypes functional. Now what, Land what uh, Patchett did to design this gun was essentially pull elements from both the Sterling and the Lanchester machine guns. So this has the tube, the, the receiver tube dimensions of the Sten gun. Uh, the same diameter, the same thickness. Incidentally, that's part of why there are Sterling submachine guns made on Sten tubes in the United States. But that's a totally separate issue. Uh, in addition to the Sten receiver elements, he took a number of elements from the Lanchester. He took the ventilated barrel shroud here, the magazine well, um, and in particular the magazine release are very similar, if not identical, to those of the Lanchester. Now, uh, Patchett was doing this proactively on his own. Sterling was a private company, although they were doing government contract work, and it wasn't actually until uh, January of 1944 that the British War Office put forth a requirement for this, or for a gun like this. Specifically at that point they requested a 9mm Parabellum machine carbine. It should weigh 6 pounds, it should fire 500 rounds a minute, and it should be accurate enough to put 5 aimed rounds on a 12 by 12 inch square target at 100 yards. Which, for anything other than an open bolt submachine gun, isn't that difficult of a standard. As it would turn out, Patchett's gun would almost perfectly fit these requirements. Uh, the only place where it wasn't officially suitable was the rate of fire, which on the Patchett was more like 600, 580 or 600 rounds a minute instead of a plain 500. At any rate, um, of the first hundred troop trials, well, let me back up a sec. Uh, the War Department requested a design like this in January of 1944. The Sterling Company then put together a number of prototypes to submit. Uh, by March of 44, they had submitted uh, 100 troop trials prototypes. Those went into testing, and they did really quite well. Uh, a couple of them had 10,000 rounds each put through the guns. They worked nicely. They took another four of them, put 5,000 rounds each through those. Everything was looking pretty good. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the Patchett is and how it's different from the Sterling submachine guns. The stock on the Patchetts and the Sterlings here is particularly distinctive, but let's take a look at what makes this different from a regular Sterling gun. First off, we have a 90 degree magazine well, and that's because the original Patchetts used Sten and or Lanchester magazines. Sten and Lanchester magazines are interchangeable. So that was the standard magazine in use by the British. It makes sense that that's what Patchett would use initially, until he later went to design and develop his own better magazine. By the way, while we're here, uh, take a quick look at the markings on this. It's a Patchett machine carbine, Mark 1. This is number 047. This is one of the troop trials, or one of the prototypes, that was delivered in 1944. There are persistent rumors, by the way, that a couple of Patchett machine carbines were actually field tested in the paratroop drop at Arnhem. Um, this has never been actually proven. And there are three specific guns, numbers 67, 70, and 72, 
that show up in British documentation before Arnhem and never show up again afterwards. Um, they've never been located, it's unknown if they still survive, but those are the three specific guns that might possibly have actually been in the drop at Arnhem. Anyway, this stock works a little bit differently than a Sterling stock. On this you have a little some knurled pads up here at the top. Grab that, pull it back, and then you can fold the stock up and lock it down like that. You then have to push this lock in, push the rear end cap of the gun in, and you can fold the stock down. And then up here we have a cutout in the front to match this lug. So that lug locks in, and that locks the stock in place. And yes, the Sterling is what was used to equip stormtroopers in Star Wars, which is where everyone recognizes it from. For comparison, the standard Sterling gun has a flat spring in here that you have to push in, and then you can do this, and it also has a spring in the butt plate, which the Patchet does not. Up here on the front end there are a couple other elements that the Sterling has that the Patchet does not. Uh, we have a bayonet lug here, and we also have a forward hand stop. The bayonet lugs were tested first in 1944 uh, and eventually added. Some of the Trials guns were retrofitted with bayonet lugs, this particular one was not. The patchets have aluminum grips on them, where the standard production Sterling has just a molded plastic grip. And the patchet has milled front sight protectors in place of the simpler stamped ones on the Sterling. Now these Troop Trials guns were finished by being parkerized and then painted over, and uh, it's worth noting that on the patchets the magazine well was welded on and then they would grind down the welds, and some of them look pretty crude. This one's not too bad. Uh, the machining work on this one actually looks pretty decent, but you can tell there that you've got some ground down welding under the paint. Well, one of the other distinctive elements of the Sterling is this black crackle paint sort of bedliner style finish. Uh, that is a paint that was available at the Sterling factory, and it was found to be quite durable, and it did a really good job of hiding the grind marks from those welded on magazine wells. Now eventually in mass production they would switch uh, techniques and they would go to induction brazing, which didn't require you know a heavy thick paint to cover up. but that paint did serve a couple other functions early in patchet production. Oh, I also want to point out here, if you look here on the original patchets, the, the space between the charging handle slot and the ejection port is really thin. There's just a little tiny bit of metal connecting between those. Uh, that was clearly overly delicate, um, and on the Sterling the geometry has been changed a bit to put a, quite a lot more material in that spot. Now let's go ahead and take a look on the inside. So to disassemble this I'm going to depress this lock button and then I push the end cap in and rotate it about 45 degrees, and then the end cap comes off, got a spring in there with it. Now patchet disassembly is a little funky. We actually have to take the firing pin out first. This is an element that's substantially different from the Sterling. Once the firing pin's out then we can take out the charging handle, which has a hole to retain the firing pin, and then we can take out the bolt itself. Yet another of the distinctive Sterling elements is uh, this radial fluting on the bolt. This was done so that the bolt is actually only riding on these surfaces, and there's lots of space in between for dirt or sand or mud or other grit uh, to sort of accumulate out of the way. Like if that material is going to get into the gun, the best thing you can do is give it a place where it can be kept without uh, causing the gun to malfunction. So that was the purpose here. Uh, this was introduced in 1944. Now if we compare the patchet bolt on top to a standard sterling bolt on the bottom, they're mostly the same, but you can see there is some dimensional difference here. And they both have firing pins that are removable, 
but in different ways. So the patchet firing pin is held in place by the charging handle. It's a separate unit right here. On the Sterling, they kept this additional weight at the back, but they moved it to be in basically just a weight and not be attached to the firing pin. And on the Sterling charging handle, there's no hole through it for the firing pin because the firing pin on the Sterling lives up in the front of the bolt from here forward. And lastly, I should show you the fire control group. This is this works the exact same way as the Sterling. So we've got one cross pin here that is either in free or lock when it's in the free position. We can pull that cross pin out. It's not a screw even though it's slotted. Um, it is just a locking pin that holds the fire control assembly in place. So one of uh, Patchett's cool setups here was to have this modular removable fire control assembly. It is set up for safe, semi, and full, so you can fire single shots. That was part of the, the War Department requirement for semi-auto fire capability. And there we go, snaps right back in. All right, so how did we go from the Patchett to the Sterling? Well, uh, in, the, in final testing in 1945, uh, the Patchett worked really well. It met all of the requirements of the War Department. They were willing to overlook that slightly high rate of fire. Um, and it was officially deemed perfectly acceptable. And then the British government opted not to actually buy any because, well, World War II is basically over now. They have a ton of Sten guns and they don't really need any new submachine guns or a new machine carbine. So Patchett wasn't totally discouraged, I'm sure he was a bit discouraged, but he continued to work on the gun. In 1946 he patented the roller assisted magazine that is now iconic of the Sterling submachine guns, and he continued to work on development of this gun. It was uh, tested again by the British in 1951, in specifically it was tested against uh, the MCEM-3 British experimental submachine gun as well as the Danish Madsen M50. And the Patchett came out as the best gun in that trial. At that point, that's not a Patchett like this. It's basically a Sterling gun with a bayonet lug and the new magazine. And in 1953, the guns were finally actually adopted by the British military, and they started ordering them in quantity. So at that point, the gun was being manufactured by the Sterling Company, and it took on that name. So the Sterling submachine gun was absolutely designed by Patchett. He got his name on the prototypes, he didn't get his name on the final production gun. And of course the, the Sterling uh, would be recognized as one of the really great Cold War submachine guns. Um, it's simple, it's cheap, it's very reliable and very easy to shoot well. Anyway, uh, a big thanks to the Army Museum here in Brussels. They have a fantastic set of uh, display of uniforms, small arms, artillery, it's a fantastic war museum. Uh, one of the few that still has a tremendous number of small arms actually on display. So if you are in Brussels, I highly recommend taking half a day or a full day to come and check out their extensive displays. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.